Are you ready for the main event, ladies and gentlemen? We just had three main events right there, but now the main, the main event. As you know, tonight's debate is called, Is There a God Who Speaks? In the vernacular, the real topic of the debate is, Does God Exist? We have Dan Barker, and we also have Dr. Richard Howe. So why don't you gentlemen come up here while I introduce you? Um, and you can give them a round of applause as they come up. Their uh, bios, their full bios, of course, in the app. So if you would take out the app right now, I'm not going to read their bios, but the app is critical for this debate because you're going to be able to answer, or at least ask questions via the app. So if you go to the app and go to the menu, it says right there, what does it say, Adam, activity or something? Activity feed. In the activity feed, if you want to put a question, you just put the question in the activity feed and put the hashtag debate so we can find it down here in the front row. Adam and I will be down here in the front row keeping the debate moving. And when we get to the Q&A, we're going to take your questions that you ask on the activity feed and ask both Dan and Richard the questions, okay? So the way the debate's going to go tonight is we're going to have two 20-minute opening statements. Since uh, Dr. Howe is doing the affirmative, he will go first for 20 minutes. Then uh, Mr. Barker will go second for 20 minutes. Then we'll have uh, 10 minute uh, rebuttals. We'll have some seven-minute cross-examination periods. Then we're going to have about 20 minutes of Q&A from you, five-minute closing statements. Then we'll all be exhausted and go home. All right, that's kind of the plan. So let me tell you a little bit about uh, Dan Barker. He does have a degree in religion from Azusa Pacific University. In fact, for 19 years, Dan was an ordained minister, and he's also a, mu a musician, so he did a lot of work with Christian music companies. Uh, and uh, for uh, a number of years since then, he, he lost his faith at some point, did a lot of reading, and decided Christianity was not true. Now he co-leads the Freedom From Religion Foundation, and he also is a host of a radio program, Free Thought Radio. You can see all the details right there on the app. Dr. Richard Howe was brought up in a Christian home as well, but at some point as an adult, he lost his faith and he came back to Christianity largely through apologetics. He has a degree in philosophy from the University of Arkansas. And as you know, he is a professor here at Southern Evangelical Seminary. And so Richard's going to start. He's going to give us the affirmative case. And then, as I say, Dan will go after him. And we'll be in the front row trying to keep things on track. So, Richard, are you ready to go? No. He's not ready. Okay, we've got to give him a little bit more time. You ready to go ready. now? Yes. All right, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Richard Howe. Don't start my time yet. There's something wrong with the choreography here. Okay, so I need to get this going. So you can talk awkwardly among yourselves while I get my computer going. Or I could do my balloon animals. <laughs> Either one. Yeah, right. Awesome, man. It's going. Yeah, right. It's going to blow up. Okay, so don't start my time yet, but that's okay. But I just want to... Where, where is my wife, Rebecca? Okay, this is my wife, Rebecca. Hello. Wave, everyone. I just want to know where to, where to look. We're streaming this, my understanding. I just have a penchant for wasting streaming time. That was all. I, I wanted to do that. So, uh, 
you know, post-production can take care of this. The live streaming people can't. But I just wanted to, before we get going here, do product placement. So they don't necessarily endorse a side in this, but Dasani is refreshing both debaters tonight. So wherever the camera is, there. So what we're hoping is some, because I do product placement everywhere I go in the world, I'm hoping someday whoever's putting on the event will get like a million dollar check for the product placement there. So we shall see if that is the case. So let me just get my timer going so I don't have to drive Frank crazy. Yes, right. All right, so what we want to do today is talk about whether there is a God who speaks, namely, is there a God? Now, I'm taking a little bit of a risk here, at least a risk as far as I can see, because I think, and I won't necessarily argue this point tonight, but I believe that the question of God's existence is a question that's philosophical, it's a philosophical question. So, I'm going to give a philosophical argument in due course, and the risk I'm running is that when I teach my courses, I have the luxury of time of sort of teasing out the categories over the course of 14 weeks, three hours a week. We don't have the luxury of time tonight, obviously, so I want you to just pay special attention, not that it's above your intellect, but we're just going to track fast with the categories as we go through. Time Magazine, back in the 60s, in the late 60s, mid-60s really, cover story, Is God Dead? And it was putting its finger on movements, both theological and secular, that were arguing that the concept of God had passed its functionality and usefulness for particularly American society. Interestingly, though, it had an article follow-up about three years later, Is God Coming Back to Life? Which this one doesn't get quoted as often as I, in the literature as the first one does, not quite as sensational. But it was talking about the way various theologians and even lay Christians were trying to respond to the God is dead movement and sort of get the question of God and more particularly the Christian message back into the lives of people. Now, most of the time in my experience as an apologist and a philosopher, you run into uh, a number of contemporary arguments. I'm not going to give these arguments. I just want to tell you what they are. But, and if, if, if Dan wants to respond to any of them, that's fine. But, I mean, these aren't my arguments. But I want you to see where my argument fits in and or contrasts with what you find most often. For example, you hear arguments to the effect that God is the cause of the beginning of the universe. So you'll see an argument like this, and I'm not given this argument, I'm just telling you what the argument is. I'm not going to defend it. The universe began to exist, whatever begins to exist as a cause of its existence, therefore the universe has a cause of existence. And typically the literature is going to focus on the second premise, whatever begins to exist, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, it's first premise, I highlighted the wrong one, that the universe began to exist. It's going to focus on that. And in doing so, what it will do is generally marshal scientific evidence for the fact that the universe began to exist. This is common in the literature. So you'll see issues relating to the Big Bang Theory and how that argues for the beginning of the universe, or issues like uh, expanding universe and how that points to the beginning universe, or second law of thermodynamics and how that points to a beginning universe, all to fit into this original argument. You'll also hear arguments along the line that somehow God is the cause of the design of the argument. And the key term here is, des is design. And again, not unlike the first one, you'll often hear scientific evidence given for this. So you'll see things dealing with design extrinsic to the whole, to the universe, that is having to do with the universe as a whole. So you'll hear things like the fine-tuning for life and the initial conditions of the Big Bang, or how, or how life came about in terms of uh, the history of, of life on earth, how did it originate. But you also have intrinsic concepts of design, dealing with things like design as information, where the DNA molecule is, is information, and so if you have information, you have an intelligent cause, and therefore it must be God. Our design is irreducible complexity, minimal thresholds that have to be an entire given in biological history, or knowledge of reality. So if we were just random, the products of random mutation, the argument goes, then somehow we wouldn't be able to know whether our senses give us accurate knowledge. So these are all kind of design-esque 
kinds of arguments. Now, it seems to me that there are both strengths and weaknesses, and these are just a few strengths and weaknesses that occur to me. I'm sure you could probably think of many more strengths and weaknesses if you reflect upon it. First of all, just a, some strength of these contemporary arguments before I give you my argument. First of all, they appeal to the common sense notion that something can only begin to exist by being caused to exist. So, you know, as we'd say in Mississippi where I grew up, 99 times out of 10, if somebody thinks something came into existence, they're going to say it had some kind of cause. So it's kind of a common sense notion. They, the arguments also appeal to the common sense notion that anything that exhibits sufficient evidence of design is likely caused by an intelligence. And so the intelligence is supposed to be God. Another strength is that these arguments often appeal to the data from contemporary science with all the social clout, et cetera, that science has. So science resonates with people a lot more readily. If you have something that sounds scientific, then typically people, at least in Western civilization, are going to accede to, to the point. And then last, the arguments generally avoid trafficking in the technicalities of ac academic philosophy. So that's really where the rub is going to come because people don't have the patient. If it's, if it's not your area, then the technicalities in any discipline are likely to just bore if it's not your particular area, uh, philosophy, just like any. But I also think there are weaknesses, and I don't want to overstate this. What I mean by weaknesses is just how hard it is in some instances to marshal these arguments, especially in a, a rigorous debate format like we're doing tonight. For example, these arguments, it seems to me, do not in and of themselves demonstrate that the cause of the universe still exists today. It seems minimally they only show at most, I should say, they, uh, sorry, let me back up. Minimally, they show that there was a cause designer when the universe began or when the thing was designed. But whether God still exists could only be argued by shoring up the argument with supplementary arguments. And I'm not suggesting one couldn't do that. I'm just saying, okay, but now you've just added to the mix as far as the arguments you're having to marshal. And also, the arguments, it seemed to me, they do not demonstrate that the cause of the universe that is, is God. That is, in my estimation, and this will become a little bit more clear when I give my argument, that it doesn't show that the, this cause has the attributes historically assigned to God, that is, classical Christian theism, whatever that ends up looking like. There's also my weaknesses in trying to give such arguments, because certain aspects of the science are disputed. So, you know, and I've done these debates before. In fact, Dan and I have debated before, and I've given some of these arguments, and I might marshal some scientific expert, and then he might be able to come back uh, with his own scientific expertise, or maybe he'll quote another scientific expert. We might volley back and forth a couple of times, and then we just go home. And, that, and that's, I can't really referee the debate uh, beyond that. Uh, but even more to the point, these arguments, to me, they get invariably get technical, and so they're beyond the knowledge of the non-scientists like me. So I can't, again, referee that. So if I brought a scientific argument and Dan came with another scientific argument, I'd just go, well, you know, let's flip a coin and see which scientific argument you want. Now, one of my favorite philosophers of the 20th century, I think one of the most brilliant philosophers that lived in the entire 20th century was a man named Joseph Owens. And he gives me license to give these arguments that I just got through saying I'm not going to give but also to encourage me to go on to give the argument that I'm going to give. And he says this, Other arguments may vividly suggest the existence of God, press it home eloquently to human consideration, and for most people provide much greater spiritual and religious aid than difficult metaphysical demonstrations. But on the philosophical level, these arguments are open to rebuttal and refutation, for they are not philosophically cogent. Now, I'm not suggesting that the argument I'm going to give tonight is not open to rebuttal. Presumably, that's what Dan is prepared to do. But I, I am suggesting that at least if we are dealing with it on the plane at which it ought to be dealt with, which is a philosophical issue, I feel a little bit more comfortable doing that than I would be on most of the scientific things. So to that end, let me give you a philosophical argument for the existence of God. This argument actually comes from Thomas Aquinas there. Uh, and it's actually not an argument that is commonly touted even by people who want to give an argument from Thomas Aquinas. Because what is interesting about this argument is that the argument demonstrates not that there is a cause of the universe's beginning to exist, but that there is a cause of the universe's current existing. 
So it's the difference between beginning or coming into existence and then existing right at this instant at every moment of its existing. Now, Dan says in his book, Godless, he says, the old cosmological argument claimed that since everything has a cause, there must be a first cause, an unmoved first mover. Today, no theistic philosophers defend that primitive line because if anything needs a cause, so does God. I'm curious about what old cosmological argument he has in mind because, at least in my experience, with a master's degree from a state university in philosophy and a PhD in, from a state university in philosophy, I've never heard anyone in the history of philosophy of religion ever give an argument that says that everything that begins to exist uh, must have a cause. That's never been an argument. I'm not saying there can't be some eighth grader that put that up on his blog last night uh, on the internet. I'm just saying if you look at the rank and file philosophical philosophers of religion, then none of them have ever made this argument. So it's in effect a, a straw man. What does this argument do that I want to make? It employs two of Aquinas's philosophical, or I'm sorry, not two, three of Aquinas's philosophical doctrines. His understanding of essence his understanding of existence, so the Latin word is essay, and I say that just in case I, out of habit, say the essay, not because I'm fluent in Latin, it's just that I'm used to using that word in this context. And then the connection between the two, how essence and existence are distinguished from one another. Let me define the terms for you. Essence is what something is. It's what it is. Existence is that it is. So, Consider yourself as a human being. As a human being, your essence is, is, as a human, is distinct from your existence as a being. Your essence is what makes you human. Your existence is what makes you a being. Your essence is what you are. Your existence is that you are. Now, the essence-existence distinction basically says this, that insensible objects, that is, objects you can you can detect with your senses, see, hear, taste, touch, or smell. There is a real distinct existence. That essence and existence are distinct in sensible objects is evident from the fact that one can understand what something is without knowing whether it is, and you can even know whether something is and not know exactly what it is. So the fact that your intellect can make that distinction, I think, points to some kind of real distinction. Now, I just quickly want to tell you why this matters in terms of cash value. You remember in the Nuremberg trial, the Nazi defendants couldn't be tried on the basis of the laws of the justices who were presiding over them, the Soviet Union, France, UK, and the United States, because they weren't citizens of those nations. But neither could the Nazi defendants be tried on the basis of German law, because nothing they did in the final solution to the Jewish question was against German law. Hitler made sure he retooled the laws in the Constitution so that it, nothing was illegal. So how did they try the Nazi defendants? They tried them on the basis, uh, and they used a phrase that we still use today, and to my knowledge, this is the first time that phrase was employed. They were tried on the basis of, of committing crimes against humanity. Now ask yourself, well, what is a humanity? What is a humanity? Is it male or female? Is it black or white? Is it young or old? Is it sick or healthy? Is it rich or poor? What is a humanity? I would submit to you, a humanity either is real in some sense of the term real, or it's not real in some sense of the term real. If it's not real in any sense of the term real, then how in the world can you commit a crime against it? If it's not real, how could you commit a crime against something that isn't real? If it is real, then I will submit without much argument tonight that your understanding of what is the nature of a humanity, that your understanding of it will either track some form of the philosophy of Plato or some form of the philosophy of Aristotle. And I think those have been the fountainheads of Western thought for the past 24 or so hundred years. So what is my argument here? Whatever is true of you is true of you either because of your essence or not. For example, by the way, if that looks familiar, I'm modeled for that. Hey, that's a guy that's debate, right? But he had clothes on that night. The reason you have rationality is because you're a human. It's part of your essence as a human to have rationality. You have rationality by virtue of being human, or rationality is caused by your essence. These are four ways of saying the same fact. The fact that you have risibility, which Aristotle thought was unique to human beings, but maybe dolphins serve as a counterexample to that. 
That's the ability to laugh. So the reason you have risibility is because you're a human. It's part of your essence as a human to have risibility. You have risibility by virtue of being human. Risibility is caused by your essence. Now, is the reason you're at this debate tonight because you're human? Is it part of your essence? And if you want to, you can think of essence in some sense as a definition, though it's more than just that. Is it part of your essence as a human to be here tonight? Are you at this debate by virtue of being human? Is being at this debate caused by your essence? And I would submit to you the answer is obviously not. Otherwise, you wouldn't have been human before you got here. You won't be human after you left. And no one that's not, any, anyone that's not here tonight right now is not a human being. It's not part of what it is in the essence of humanity to be at this debate. But then why are you able to be at this debate even though it's not part of your essence to be at this debate? Well, uh, you're at this debate because you caused yourself to be at this debate. So you could think of any number of things that are true about you that you can cause yourself. Why I have a white shirt on. Actually, that was my wife that caused me to have the white shirt on. But, uh, but you know, why, or you may have something that's caused in you that, that uh, somebody gave you. Like the guy said, when the little kid asked the guy, well, where did you get that black eye? Somebody give it to you? He said, no, son, I didn't. Uh, nobody gave that to me. I had to fight for that black eye, you know, so somebody had to give it to me. So think about then, as we press this question, instead of your rationality or risibility or being at this debate, consider the fact that you're existing right now. Is the reason you exist because you're human? Is it part of your essence as a human to exist? Do you exist by virtue of being human? Is your existence caused by your essence? I think the answer clearly is no. But just as clearly, you could not be the cause of your existing. Otherwise, you'd have to be existing before you're existing, which is incoherent. But if you're not the cause of your own existing then that must be caused by something else. Something else must be causing you to exist. But what about that thing's existence? What caused it to exist? Either it exists by virtue of its essence, or it's caused to exist by something else. Now let me just put a little quick uh, pause right there and say a few words about existence so that I can unpack a little bit more of the import of what we've even discovered so far before I finish the argument. Suppose you saw a giant glass ball. And you might ask, seeing the ball, well, how did that ball come to be? So I took this ball when my wife and I were in Venice, Italy. And if somebody said, well, you know, it's made over in Murano, and they shipped it over here, and it's to celebrate the opening of this new Vaporetta stop, blah, blah. And you'd be happy with that. You're you're satisfied with the explanation. But in, in distinction from the glass ball, suppose you were hearing music. You would not ask, how did the music come to be? Right? Rather, you would ask, What is causing the music to be? Now, this is just an analogy. Because unlike the glass ball, you realize music only is music as it is being caused to be music at every instant that is music. As soon as the cause of the music stops causing the music, the music is just gone. So that idea is, in 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 an analogous kind of way, is how Aquinas would understand existence. Existence is an act. It's something that essences do. It is an act. It is actualizing the reality of the essence. So the argument tries to show that anything that exists that does not exist by virtue of its essence must be continually caused to exist by something whose essence is existence itself. It just is existence. Now, why is this the case? Why is it that it has to uh, be caused uh, either by, by virtue of its own essence or not? Because if that thing was not existing by virtue of its essence, it would need to be continually caused to exist by something else. And the question that usually comes up in this context is, well, can this go to infinity? You just have this sort of infinity of causes. And I want to just show you why it can't be an infinity of causes. But let me just say at the front end, lest uh, someone... Two minutes, two minutes. Yes, Lord. (laughs) Oh, sorry. Let me show you why, and let me say at this point so you won't be confused that I am not making, or Aquinas is not making a Kalam cosmological argument. He's not talking about the impossibility of infinite regress. It's the difference between a per se infinite and a per accident infinite. Let me just show you the differences if I can get them in in a minute and a half. You've got this man who sires a son, who sires a son, who sires a son. What is interesting about this causal relationship is that this chain, in Aquinas' estimation, could be infinite because there's nothing about any one of those causal relationships that depends 
at the moment of the prior relationship. As Aquinas would say, it is accidental to this particular man as generator to be generated by another man. For he generates as a man and not as the son of another man. Now, if that's not clear to you, watch how it contrasts. Because contrast father, son, grandson, you know, down. Contrast that with a hand pushing a stick, pushing a rock. Not only is it the case that the hand is pushing the stick and the stick is pushing the rock, but the hand is also causing the stick to be a pusher of the rock. Do you see the difference? The father doesn't cause the son to be a father of his son. So that causal relationship might be infinite as far as Aquinas is concerned. But the father, but the uh, uh, hand pushing the stick, pushing the rock, it's not just pushing the stick, but it's causing the stick to be a pusher of the rock. And I think the illustration that uh, best fits for me as far as just trying to imagine it graphically is a set of interlocking gears. It's not like falling dominoes where one falls and then the, and then the rest going to do their thing no matter what, what happens to that domino. If you imagine all these gears turning, then they're all turning simultaneously. Well, there has to be some gear whose very essence is turning. Because if you just have, Time. even if you had an infinite number just of gears. Just complete your thought. Time. Thank you. Right. If you. Even if you had an infinite number of gears, they couldn't be turning on their own without some gear that its very essence is to turn. So by analogy, there can't be anything existing without there being something that existing whose very essence is existence itself. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Dan Barker now. Don't forget, as they're switching out computers, if you would take out your, uh, your app right now, your iPhone, your Droid, or if you're one of the seven people in the world with a Windows phone, take that out. And go to the, go to the uh, app for today's activity feed. If you go to activity worry, feed, right, right up there in the left-hand corner, you'll see a little menu there. And then go down and click on uh, activity feed or activity stream. You can put your question there and put a hashtag debate and ask your question there. So it looks to me like he went like 22 minutes, 23 by my clock. Uh, did, were you timing it? Uh, yeah, he, he had a lot of intro stuff. So if you want to do some intro stuff, Dan, go ahead and you just tell me when you're ready to start with the material. Well, you know, I used to be a preacher. I could go forever. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long time since I've stood in a pulpit. And I have to say that standing here right now is bringing back some of those old feelings. I, I just have to say I had this almost uncontrollable urge to take up a collection. I, uh, <laughs> somebody stop me from that. <laughs> so wait a minute, what am I doing here? Back, 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 back. So I've really been looking forward to this. And I think it's very generous and very gracious of you at a conference like this to invite an infidel, an atheist, a heathen, to come in, a pagan, whatever you want to call me, I take it as a compliment, to come and address an apologetics conference. During my rebuttal, I will respond to Richard's comments. Today is Friday the 13th. I know none of you are superstitious, but I got to tell you something that you're not going to believe. Well, maybe I shouldn't tell this crowd what they believe or not. Uh, you believe what you want. But when I was leaving my hotel room today, I saw a black cat in the hallway of the hotel. And the cat came up to me and said, Allah es el único Dios verdadero. 
What? You don't believe that? Do any of you believe that? There's always one hand in every crowd, right? What, is this a room full of skeptics? I told you a story. I gave you a personal testimony that a cat came up and spoke to me. I understand why you're skeptical, because cats don't talk. We all know that. I hope you all got the skeptics discount for coming to this conference, because we're all skeptics. I think the difference between you and me is that I'm skeptical about one more thing than you're skeptical about. When I read in Genesis that a snake spoke human language, I'm skeptical, just like you, because snakes don't talk. I used to believe that a snake spoke human language, and so did a donkey and a seven-headed beast in the book of Revelation who blasphemed. I preached the gospel for 19 years, and I loved it, before I eventually threw out all the bathwater, and I discovered there's no baby there. I finally realized the truth about humanity, whether you want to call it existence or essence, the truth about who we are as human beings. We are biological organisms in a natural environment, and that's all we are. And that's wonderful. That's more than enough. It's amazing. But you believers here tonight, you think we are more than that. You think there's something that transcends, like a soul or a spirit, that goes above and beyond nature. You're imagining a supernatural realm beyond what we all just commonly, naturally experience. You can believe that. It's just a free country. You're welcome to believe that, but belief is not knowledge. If it were, we wouldn't need the word belief. If the only way you can accept an assertion is by faith, you're admitting that that assertion cannot be accepted on its own merits. You need to boost it with something else. So for tonight's debate, belief is really irrelevant, and I think maybe even Richard would agree. He wants to, we want to know. We don't want to just believe. Since you are claiming there's something above and beyond, then you have the burden of proof. I don't have anything to prove. I'm not making an additional claim. You're the one making the additional claim. I'm not automatically rejecting your claim. If there is a God who speaks, that would be amazing. That would be an incredible fact of reality. It would change everything. It would change medicine. It would change science. It would change public policy. It would change everything if that God really did exist. We atheists are open to anything that can be described and observed. But, so far, I am skeptical. Skepticism is not arrogance. Skepticism is not sticking your head in the sand. Skepticism is a simple matter of carefulness. If God really exists, why are we having a debate about it? Doesn't this debate actually undercut the reality of God? Why are we talking about proofs and arguments? Why are all these books about six arguments for God's existence? Why doesn't this God, who exists, make himself known to me? Why doesn't he do that? That's the question that Korah asked of Moses, and that's the question that Martin Luther asked of the Pope. Why do we need intermediaries? Why do I need you to tell me about it? Doesn't apologetics actually show that God is too weak to speak for himself? Oh, the Bible? The Bible is God speaking for himself? The Bible is something. It's ink on paper. It's humans speaking. Whoever put that ink on the paper was a human being. I know you have a theology that there was an inspiration behind it, but look at it from a skeptical point of view. This is ink on paper. This is stories. They might be interesting stories, they might be good stories, they might be bad stories, but it's not evidence, it's not good evidence for a God. We atheists, we don't claim to know everything. I'm certainly not the smartest guy in the world. That's okay, because atheism is not making any claims. Atheism simply means without theism. It doesn't mean anti-theism. You can be an atheist and want to believe in God. You can be an atheist to you know, who loves Jesus. You can be an atheist if you don't have a belief in a God. That's all it means. 
Atheism is not a positive proposition. It's not a science. It's not an epistemology. Atheism is not a philosophy or even a moral system, although most atheists do know how to be moral, sometimes more moral than believers. Atheism is certainly not a religion. It, atheism has no creed, no dogma, no clergy, no infallible authorities, no holy books, no rituals, no missionaries. Atheism has no commandments. Atheism is simply the absence of theism, the absence of a belief in God. And an absence is not a thing. If the religions of the world were a list of TV channels that you could browse through, Atheism would not be on that list. Atheism is the off button, none of the above. Atheists experience the natural world directly, not through some screen of faith. There's an old joke that if atheism is a religion, then baldness is a hair color. Or as a... <laughs> there you go. You're the high priest of baldness. I'm trying to catch up to you there, Richard, but uh, um, during our last debate, I think we both had a lot more um, energy. <laughs> baldness has a hair color, or as Bill Maher might say it, celibacy is, if atheism is a religion, then celibacy is a sex position. It is your job as Christian apologists, not only to prove the supernatural, but also to demonstrate the reliability and the moral worth of the book on which your whole system of faith is based. A book with talking animals, a disembodied hand floating in the air writing on the wall, sticks turning into snakes, a magic wand, wizards, sorcerers, and demons, the Nile River turning to blood, the sun standing still and moving backwards, a seven-headed beast who speaks blasphemy, tens of millions of animal species floating in one large box. And you wonder why I am skeptical? You ought to be skeptical about these stories, too. You're skeptical when they occur in other religions. We'll get back to the Bible, but first let me briefly summarize the reasons for atheism. And maybe we can go into greater depth later if Richard wants to dig deeper. As I said, atheism is the absence of belief. I'm an atheist because of a number of absences or lacks. First, there's the lack of a coherent definition of God. The Bible says God is a spirit. But what is a spirit? Nobody has ever defined what a spirit is in positive terms. No one's ever done that. It's only defined by what it's not, immaterial essence or intangible soul. Many definitions of God contain mutually exclusive characteristics, such as omniscience and omnipotence, or omnipotence and omnibenevolence. It's like arguing for the existence of a married bachelor. Not only can it not exist, it doesn't exist. It's illogical for some of these characteristics of God to actually exist in one person. A being who knows free will cannot exist. Any being who knows the future cannot have free will. Did I say that wrong? Let me say that again. A being who knows the future cannot have free will. It's an impossibility. It's a logical impossibility. If you can't define this God that you are arguing for, then how can it exist? There's also a lack of good evidence for a God. If there were good evidence by now, somebody should have won the Nobel Prize for pointing that out. Some hitherto unknown force in the cosmos. Where, are, where is it? Where's the evidence? Where's the actual proof beyond your faith? There's also a lack of good argument, and Richard pretty eloquently touched on that tonight, actually. There have been many attempts to reason for God's existence using words alone, the teleological, cosmological, ontological, moral arguments, and so on. Bertrand Russell said, most of those arguments simply boil down to bad grammar. Most of them beg the question. When the ancients heard the thunder and they saw the lightning, the only way they could explain it was by invoking Thor or Zeus. But now we know something about electricity and the weather. We don't need those gods to fill those gaps in our knowledge. When those gaps closed, those gods of the gap died. There's still gaps in our knowledge. And that's what drives science to try to answer those questions. But to just throw up your hands and say, Thor did it, or 
God did it. Well, that's just laziness. Another reason I'm an atheist is because of the lack of agreement among believers about the nature and the moral principles of God. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians, Let there be no divisions among you. Be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same spirit. He also said, God is not the author of confusion. But can you think of a single book that's caused more confusion than the Bible? All these sects and denominations and fights and differences of theology and opinion and... You believers should first get your own act together before you start talking to us non-believers. We are hearing thousands of conflicting claims from you theists. Name any moral issue of the day that society is struggling with. You name it, what, whatever it is, uh, birth control or the war or uh, uh, doctor-assisted suicide. Name these issues and you will find good Bible-believing, church-going Christians on both sides of those issues. The Bible obviously gives very little unambiguous guidance on moral issues. And there's the lack of the effectiveness of prayer. The Bible talks about prayer. Many, many, many times the Bible says, whatever you shall ask in my name, believing you shall receive over and over again. If you have the faith of a grain of mustard, the Bible repeatedly says that your prayers will be answered. But if you take all the prayers that have ever been prayed, they add up to no more than random chance. On the National Day of Prayer this year, our president prayed to ask for God's protection. That was on May the 4th. On the same day, the Florida governor prayed for blessings in our state and nation. And Texas Governor Abbott prayed for America's protection from danger, recognizing the power of prayer. A few weeks later, those powerful prayers were answered with death and devastation from Hurricanes Harvey and Irma. Nothing fails like prayer. The Freedom From Religion Foundation's charitable arm, Non-Belief Relief, has sent more than $100,000 to Texas, Florida, and Puerto Rico to help with disaster recovery. We agree with Robert Ingersoll that the hands that help are better far than lips that pray. But most important, there's no need for a God. Hundreds of millions of good people lead loving, joyful, moral, charitable, meaningful, productive, and hopeful lives without superstition and faith. In addition to all those absences, we think so-called holy books like the Bible are unreliable and immoral. I think people should read the Bible. Many people say that reading the Bible was the main reason they became atheists in the first place. A. A. Milne said, the Old Testament is responsible for more atheism than any book ever written. Isaac Asimov agreed, properly read, the Bible is the most potent force for atheism ever conceived. Most Christians don't read it. They read a few verses, but they don't actually know what it says. The Bible says God is good. But if you take off the glasses of faith and just read it, you will see that is not true. This book is depraved. If you claim to be a good person, this book should embarrass you and it should disgust you. It's obvious that the alpha male God in this book reflects the fears, the ignorance, the territorialism, and the arrogance of the patriarchal Israelites who wanted to preserve their property, including their slaves and their wives. The God they invented is an abusive husband. He controls his wife, the Israelites, with threats and violence. Richard Dawkins said in The God Delusion, the God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. Jealous and proud of it, a petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, philicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. I'm going to set that to music one of these days. It's going to be a great song. And Richard is right. Richard asked me to write a book documenting each of those nasty adjectives. It's called God, the Most Unpleasant Character in All Fiction. It goes into great detail and broad context of more than 1,500 passages describing the biblical God by his own words and actions. I came up with eight more, actually. 
God is also a pyromaniacal, angry, merciless, curse-hurling, aborticidal, vaxicidal, cannibalistic slave monger. We only have time for a few tiny examples out of the 1500. God's an ethnic cleanser. You shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land, for I have given you the land to possess. That's ethnic cleansing. Utterly destroy all that they have. Do not spare them. Kill both man and woman, child and infant. God is genocidal. You must not let anything that breathes remain alive. You shall annihilate them. So they utterly destroyed the men, the women, the little ones of every city and left none to remain. There are dozens more genocidal passages in the Bible. God is unjust. I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children. That is unjust. God is misogynistic. Now here, look at Jeremiah 13. When the Israelites asked, why are the Babylonians invading and killing and raping their women? Here's what God said. It is for the greatness of your iniquity that your skirts are lifted up and you are violated. Raped is the word there. Because you have forgotten me and trusted in lies, I myself will lift up your skirts over your face. God, by his own words, is taking credit for rape. Even if that's just metaphorical, it's a horrible thing to say, a sexist thing to say. In Isaiah, we read that the Lord will afflict with scabs the heads of the daughters of Zion, and the Lord will lay bare their secret parts. That Hebrew word poth there, secret parts, I don't have to tell you what secret parts that word is talking about. This is sexual harassment in order to humiliate. This is the Bible. What do you think about a sexist man, whether he's a common jerk or a political leader, who boasts about groping women? God is homophobic. You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. They shall be put to death. Their blood is upon them. That should settle it right there. If the Bible says homosexuality is wrong, then the Bible is wrong, not homosexuality. The men who wrote those primitive, bloodthirsty words were bigoted and cruel and intolerant. Two minutes. And God is indeed bloodthirsty. The Bible is splattered with hundreds of bloody pages. The Lord has a sword. It is sated with blood. The blood splattered my garments and stained my clothing. God is racist. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on earth to be his people. Don't intermarry with those other people. In the book of Numbers, God told the Israelites not to mix with the Midianites because they worshiped another god. But one man decided to live his own life and chose a Midianite woman anyway. When Phinehas, son of Aaron the priest, saw it, he got up and left the congregation, took a spear in his hand, went after the Israelite man in the tent, and pierced the two of them, the Israelite and the woman, through the belly. A mixed-race couple was slaughtered by a righteous priest. Today, that terrorism would be a hate crime of the highest order. But what did God do about it? The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Phinehas has turned back my wrath. I hereby grant him my covenant of peace. It shall be for him and his descendants after him a covenant of perpetual priesthood, because he was zealous for his God. God rewarded the terrorists. God is capriciously malevolent. Here's the most damning verse in the entire Bible, Job 2.3. The Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? You incited me against him to destroy him for no reason. He tortured and killed children for no reason. In a court of law, this confession would garner a conviction for first degree and mayhem. God's not pro-life. Because she's rebelled against her God, their little ones shall be dashed in pieces and their pregnant women ripped open. May the Lord cause you to become a curse when he makes your womb miscarry. Is the New Testament Lord nicer than the old Lord? In some ways, but Jesus said, I and the Father are one. The Father's in me. The New Testament is a huge missed opportunity. Jesus should have said, I apologize for my father. He was a sexist bully. Instead, he said, whoever has seen me has seen Time. my father. Complete and your thought, father, Dan. Complete your thought. So... You can find all those verses at unpleasantgod.ffrf.org. And I have one final sentence. We've seen enough to know. How does all this relate to our debate tonight? Let me just ask this one simple question and then we're done. What is more likely, 
that this book is the product of an immaterial, supernatural creator that we don't know, or that this book is the product of fearful, patriarchal priests and prophets. We do know that human beings make up stories. We do not know that those stories are actually true. We do not know that there is a God. Thank you. Dr. Richard Howe, ladies and gentlemen, will come up with a 10-minute rebuttal to uh, Dan's statement. And again, questions are on the activity stream of the app. If you want to ask questions, we'll get to questions after a couple more rounds of back and forth. Dr. Howe. Hang on, let me, let me do my timer, Frank, if I may, so I can try to get a feel for how much time I have left before I hear. This is a 10 minute Two minutes. And <laughs> have a heart attack. Two minutes. How about right now? Just fall out. Dan mentioned the fact that we've debated before back in 1997 at the University of Florida. Apparently, neither of us did a very good job because he's still an atheist and I'm still a theist. So. <laughs> but uh, I'm kidding because uh, if you don't know much about debates, these things are designed for the audience, not for each other. So Dan's not expecting me to become an atheist. I'm not expecting him to become a theist. But we are trying to expect, or we are expecting to persuade some of you who maybe haven't made your mind up. The idea of miracles, when he tells his, uh, starts out with the story about the cat, there's one thing that's distinctive about SES's apologetic method is that we're adamant about the fact that miracles are not an argument for God's existence. Now, some Christians may try to marshal that, and I don't deny that some people may have come to believe God because they think they've experienced a miracle or read one in the Bible. But I'm saying in terms of the rationality of the argument, something by definition couldn't be a miracle unless there already is a God because the definition of a miracle is that it's an act of God. So if God doesn't exist, no event is a miracle, no matter how outrageous it is, talking snakes or talking black cats or whatever. So that doesn't have anything to do with how I would argue uh, tonight. He may, and I want to just go through just a, some quick bullet lists and make quick comments here as my time allows. He talks about the fact that all we are are just biological things. I, I would like to know how he knows this. Uh, how, how does he know what it is that we are? What is his argument for the fact that there isn't a such thing as an intellect, which is itself not material? And by not material, I don't necessarily mean that it's a separate kind of substance that is a material, not immaterial thing. It's just not material in some kind of fundamental sense of the word. He brings up the specter of faith and reason. And, and in Jan's defense and other atheists that I read, I teach a course at the seminary on contemporary atheism. In their defense, I think a lot of the things that they're responding to is just bad pop apologetics. So I would probably agree with a lot of their criticisms for example, when Sam Harris criticizes what faith is, or even in some instances what Dan may criticize what faith is, I would agree with their criticisms because I think that's not what faith is, and I don't think a Christian should, should do that. You can go to my website. I'll tell you later how to get there and, and get a, 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 a sort of a summation of what is faith in the classical tradition. It boils down to this. Believing, believing something by reason or, or Holding something on the basis of reason is on the basis of demonstration. If you see a demonstration for something and you hold it to be true, you're holding it by reason. Faith in the classical tradition from Augustine forward, and I would argue this is biblical, is believing something on the basis of authority. So I believe that Fermat's last theorem was proven to be true by Andrew Wiles at Princeton University. It's a mathematical proof I can't understand. But I'm not foolish in believing Andrew Wiles because reason tells me he's a reliable authority. Yet I am taking it on faith when he tells me that it's true because I can't see the demonstration by itself. That's what we're trying to say about faith. We just think God is a divine authority. Now, whether God's a divine authority presupposes a question of whether God exists. So it has to go back to that question, which is why we're debating debating that tonight. He brought up the definition of God not being good. I would, like, I would be interested to know, and I know to some extent because I've read his, his, his book, 
uh, what he thinks good is. What I think bogs down this debate, even among Christians, is the failure to distinguish, which I'm not going to do because I don't have time, between good and moral good. Moral good is a subset of good. I would submit to you without argument, because I'm just responding to his, his assertion, that you cannot give an, a, a coherent and cogent accounting of what it means to be good at all without committing yourself to metaphysical truths, the proper arrangement of which is the cosmological argument for God's existence. So if a person is going to say, well, I don't believe God exists, you're going to have to deny one of these metaphysical elements of the argument for God's existence. But as soon as you deny one or more of those metaphysical elements, you've evacuated the concept of good of any kind of meaning and subsequently the concept of moral good. Now, if that means anything to you, you need to therapy, basically, if that means what I just said. You need to get, rush out and get some help. No. Uh, you just want to do some research in the natural law tradition, as it's uh, the, the seeds of it laid by Aristotle, but it brings to its uh, exemplification most primarily in the thinking of Aquinas and in contemporary writers like J. Budashevsky, uh, for example. Let me just see which ones I want to hear. So he, he brings up the specter of God of the gaps. Even if I gave the arguments that I said I wasn't going to give, the reason why it's not a God of the gaps fallacy is where in those arguments, you're not positing God to explain something that you think you can't otherwise explain. You're positing God, rightly or wrongly, as an explanation of what you think is the actual evidence. So it'd be like a fire marshal who gets on the side of a burned house and he finds an accelerant-soaked rag partially burned and some uh, you know, matches a book of match, match book partially burned at this origin of the fire, and he realizes that the homeowner just took out a suspicious uh, uh, fire insurance just before the fire. Well, then he comes to the conclusion that the fire was caused by an arson. Well, it wouldn't make any sense. Go well. That's just the arson of the gaps fallacy because you haven't been able to explain. No, no, no. It's not that I can't explain the fire, so I throw out the concept of arson to make an explanation. It's that the evidence actually points to an arson because there's some kind of thing. So even in the arguments I didn't give, it's not that we're suggesting God is some kind of explanatory hypothesis that we can't you know, otherwise account for. It's that the arguments are trying to say, no, this is actually the, what the evidence actually points to. But even, even still, the argument I gave, I wasn't arguing that for God is some kind of explanation of a fact or some kind of explanatory hypothesis or some kind of inference to the best explanation. I'm trying to argue, and I, I, admittedly, I didn't have a chance to defend and massage and unpack all these categories, but if we could do that, I think what I'm arguing is that the, the conclusion that there's a being who exists whose essence is existence itself, what Aquinas would call ipsum esse subsistence, substantial existence itself, that that conclusion follows necessarily from the argument. Not that God is just some kind of uh, explanation uh, that I throw up. He brings up the specter of things like prayer and how many prayers, have you got all the prayers together. This is interesting, and I don't know what the research says about prayers and these kind of things. I don't know if Barna's ever done anything and counted noses. But that's absolutely irrelevant to the question of whether God exists. Why? Because, first of all, something wouldn't be a prayer unless there is a God, because prayer is this petition addressed to God. Second, once a person grants that there's a God whose substantial existence is self and shows how all these superlative attributes of God that classical theism has follow and cascade seamlessly from that first conclusion, once you get that in place, then you have some kind of template within which you can begin to interpret, well, why was it when this guy asked, for X, he didn't get X, but when this guy asked for X, he did get X. So it isn't just a matter of, well, this guy's prayer was unanswered, this guy's prayer was answered. You might go, no, both prayers were answered. I'm saying you might do this. It's just that God said no to this guy and God said yes to this guy. Well, why did God do that? All of those kind of questions can only be nested in the prior conclusion that there is this God in the first place that has these superlative attributes. So it's mixing categories to start importing those things from later on in the discussion and back up and say somehow this is a counterexample to the existence of God because uh, it's not. Two minutes. He talked about the... I'm sorry. <laughs> Do you say two? Two minutes. Okay, I'm going to... Do you see how I skulked back there? He brought up the idea that how much... Uh, that was a dramatic pause, by the way. 
how much confusion the Bible causes because of, uh, you know, the cacophony of conversations among Christians over the years and all these different denominations, whatever. Look, accusing the Bible of confusion by giving an example of how Christians sometimes behave is like, conf- is like accusing John F. Kennedy or Martin Luther King Jr. for causing violence because they were assassinated. No, no, no. They were the occasion upon which an evil person might have assassinated them, but they're not the cause of the assassination. Fine. The Bible may be the occasion where uh, people with unscrupulous motives or people just innocently not understanding hermeneutics or the original language might come out with all kinds of wacky beliefs. That's fine, but that's not the Bible's fault. Any more than John F. Kennedy getting assassinated was John F. Kennedy's fault. It was the fault of somebody else. So those kind of things, I think, they preach well, no pun intended, but they don't really have anything to do substantively, in my estimation, with the question whether God exists. Okay, so that's what we're trying to uh, debate tonight. He talks about the fact that there are no good evidences. One of the things I discovered when I was reading in Dan's book, and I just want to read you this quick list, because he's writing a book called Godless, and it's autobiographical, and I encourage you to get his book and read it. It's very well written, and it's very poignant in places. But if you're going to talk about whether God exists, I think it is a dereliction of research when your book doesn't even, as far as I could see, certainly not in the index, but I didn't see anywhere else in the book, no mention of Plato, no mention of Aristotle, time. no mention of Plotinus, time, no Richard. mention of pseudo Richard, time. No mention of, can I finish my Complete list? Complete your thought, go ahead. All right. No mention of uh, Avicenna, no mention of my, Maimonides, Thomas Aquinas, John Duns Scotus, Descartes, or Gottfried Leibniz. No mention of the chief architects of the classical view of the nature of God in some form or fashion are not even brought up. So I would submit to him, of course there's no evidence because you haven't looked at the arguments yet. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, keep in mind, uh, uh, Dan is going to respond to Richard's opening statement, which occurred Thursday. (laughs) Come on up, sir. I think you just ended by saying, um, of course I don't see evidence because I haven't listed all these arguments. You can't, comp- you can't say an argument is evidence. Argument is not evidence. You can maybe argue from evidence, but argument is not evidence. I think uh, the basic mistake Richard is making tonight, and it crosses over a lot of the different things that he has said, and, it is, and I think it, it's, it's a natural thing that happens to a lot of us. It happens, you know, when, when you're not thinking strictly enough, it's the mistake of reification. You take a word like existence, and just because there's a word doesn't mean the word has a thing that goes with it. I think Richard even said that. Existence is not a thing. Existence is not something you can go to the store and buy. I want to buy some existence. It's not a thing at all. It's a concept. Existence is just a concept in a mind. And somehow to separate existence from essence Even in essence, exists. But when we say exists, we're not talking about some transcendent thing. When you reify something, you make this category error where you say, well, then there must be something above and beyond this word that I'm using. He does the same thing with the word intelligence. He does the same thing with, um, I wrote these things down here, Uh, with the word humanity. Like he was, he, he actually seemed confused that the word humanity would mean something. It's a collective term. There are words that we use to refer to a group that doesn't actually exist as a thing. Humanity is not a thing. You can't, you know, you can point to any one of the members of that group, but then to take that group and put a label on it and then pretend like that group is also a thing is is a reification. It's a category mistake. So uh, I could say, for example, uh, because I'm a jazz pianist and composer, music theory transcends music composition. And when I use that word transcend, does that mean there's actually some realm up there where music theory transcends in some real world? Or am I just talking about concepts? So yeah, logically, concepts do transcend other concepts. I could ask, uh, why is it that if every member of an orchestra is in harmony with each other, does that mean all orchestras are in harmony with each other too? Do you see the mistake? by taking a collective word that refers to a group and then trying to apply 
some characteristic or finding from within the group to the collection of groups, that's a mistake. That's a category mistake. And um, he does it with rationality, too. Rationality is not a thing. Rationality is a, is a concept that describes a f part, of, part of the functioning brain. This is a tool of how the brain functions. Intelligence is the same thing. There's no such thing as intelligence. It's a word. It's a label that we use to describe the functioning of this biological organism that we have. So uh, his, his argument is very much like I debated, I've debated eight Muslim uh, scholars over the years, some in London and some in uh, Michigan and one in uh, Queens, New York. And Raja Bali was one of the Muslim, uh, uh, Muslim scholars that I debated. And he pretty much used the same argument that uh, Richard is using. It's, it's a form of the ontological argument about existence and being, as if, uh, as if our very existence requires a, uh, something be outside of it to justify his existence. But then, look at how you smuggle your conclusion. This is called begging the question. Look how Richard smuggles his conclusion into his premise by saying that everything that exists must have had some cause of some sort. And by the way, he admits it might not be a currently existing cause, but he doesn't suggest that it might also not be an intelligent cause as well. You can have causes that are not intelligent. What causes crystals to grow? Did some being come in there and put every little molecule in place and stack them up in order? Or can we explain it with natural causes, not necessarily an, a, uh, uh, an intelligent cause? So uh, I think, I think he's, it's a little bit of obfuscation here and uh, some, a little bit of, of, you know, he's a philosophy professor and I think he should know in philosophy 101 that there's different ways of talking about words at different levels. It, just because there's a concept doesn't mean there's a thing. And just because uh, just because you can say that existence needs to have a context, he smuggles his conclusion into his premise by saying, well, then there is something somewhere in the cosmos that actually doesn't have to follow that rule. There is something that doesn't have to follow the rule that essence needs to have existence, and that thing is God. Well, that just totally undercuts the argument itself. Either the argument applies universally across the entire reality or it doesn't. If it doesn't, you've taken your conclusion that there is this God and put it into your premise, and that's called begging the question. That's circular reasoning. That's a polite way of saying it's illogical. So, what is good? That's a good question, and we haven't talked about morality that much. We non-believers, secular humanists, atheists, agnostics, we know how to be good. We know what good is. We didn't need some commandments from God coming down from a mountain to tell us, guess what, there's something wrong with killing. <gasps> really? As if we were so stupid to figure, we couldn't figure that out ourselves. As human beings, we are naturally, we are naturally good animals. We basically have instincts to altruism and empathy, and uh, we're not perfect, we make mistakes, and there are some sick people in the bell curve, you might call them psychopaths or you know, criminals and that. But basically, it doesn't have to be that complicated. It's very simple. Morality and good are simply the minimization of harm. The word we're talking about here, when we talk about good, we're talking about harm. We want to avoid harm. We don't like to be burned. We don't like to be cold. We don't want to be starved. We don't like predation. We don't like disease. We don't like war. We don't like whatever it is. To be good, this is natural. You all know this. No one has to be told this. To be good is to act with the intention of minimizing harm. And whatever harm is, it's natural. Harm is the guiding principle here. That sounds a little bit like utilitarianism, but it isn't. It's more of a negative utilitarianism, I suppose. And I think we all agree, you don't, you don't have to be told this. Every little kid knows that. We know about fairness, and we know about altruism and love and caring, especially when we're our close relatives. So good is not cosmic. Good is not some top-down thing. Good is a basic bottom-up biological organism thing. As we get through life, we naturally recoil from harm. When you stick your hand in the fire, do you deliberate and go, oh my goodness, those cells are being damaged right now. I wonder what I should do. I guess rationally I should withdraw my hand. Yes, that's what I'm going to do. Is that what you do? You just naturally know. We know that harm is the principle of good and moral good. Because whatever harms me can harm you as well. And that golden rule goes way back before Jesus, way back before Hillel in the first century BC, way back even before Confucius, 500 years before that. Good is simply acting with the intention of minimizing harm. So intelligence, essence, existence, all those things are not 
things, those are concepts. And I guess I would go with you, Richard, if, if that's how you're going to argue, then your conclusion itself is also a concept. It's not an actually existing thing. It's just a concept that's in your mind that you're trying to reason up to. So I, we're going to have cross-examination in a moment. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Now is the uh, cross-examination period, and uh, Dr. Howe, uh, first of all, gentlemen, you both need your mics there. Uh, Dr. Howe will uh, begin asking uh, uh, Mr. Barker some questions for seven minutes, and uh, Dr. Howe, since it's your time, if Dan is going too long, you, you can feel free to stop him. Uh, it's your time, so if you just want to keep asking questions, if you want to let them go on, it's totally up to you. So okay. remind me how many minutes? You have seven minutes uh, from whenever you want to start. You okay. just start it off. Actually, I do have the same amount of hair I had when we debated. It's just in my shower drain now. <laughs> that's, that, that's, that's the difference. So you said, I, I, tell me if you agree with this statement, that I thought you said tonight that there wasn't a definition of God. There wasn't a good definition of God. Coherent. Is a coherent word. definition. On page 219 of your book, Godless, you say, quote, God has never been defined. Presumably you mean coherently defined or whatever. Does that sound fair? Coherently defined. Okay. If that's the case, and, and you define atheism as the lack of belief in God, then how can you know what it is that you lack of belief in if the thing you lack of belief in has never been clearly defined? Hold your applause. Hold your applause. Richard needs the time. Do you believe in slap doodle walkers? Yes. You do? Oh, no, I'm just kidding. I just, I just want to see what you'd say if I said to <laughs> Tell Doesn't me. Doesn't everybody? What do you think I am, a pagan? I'm not asking you if slap doodle walkers actually exist. I'm not asking you that. I just want to know if you believe. Do you have a belief in slap doodle walkers? I don't know whether I do or not because I don't know what it means. Do you have a belief? Though, a positive I don't know. Belief? I might. So, for, for example, if somebody said that's actually the Zulu word for moon, then I go, yeah, I guess I do okay, have a belief. Okay, but I'm asking you, do you... Wait a minute, I'm supposed to be asking you the questions here. here. So I want to know, so I don't get muddled, because I, I, I like the conversation, but I just want to make sure we don't get away from the original question. You say it's never been defined clearly, coherently, yet you say you lack a belief in it. But what if it turns out the thing that it ends up being clearly defined in, in fact, you do have a belief in it? then you wouldn't be an atheist anymore, I presume, right? That's true. Okay. So how can you know right now, then, why do you keep saying that you lack that belief? That's what I'm not clear because on. Because if you're asking me to say yes or no, that I have a belief in something, I need to know what that is. And the no, absence... no, 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 you changed the question. I didn't ask you if you knew that you had a belief in it. I said that you knew you lacked a belief in it. But if you don't know what the it is, how do you know you lack a belief in it if you don't know what it is? That's what I'm asking. How can you, how can you affirm a belief in something that you don't know? You, can, you don't have. A lack of belief You're changing is, it to affirming a belief to lacking a belief. I'm asking you, how do you know you lack a belief in it if you don't know what it even is? Well, how can you have a belief? How not, can you, I'm not asking you how do you have a belief in how it. How can you not lack a belief in something that is not defined? That's what I'm asking I think, you. I think you might be confusing. I think you might be confusing uh, a lack of belief with a denial. I'm not denying. I'm lacking a belief. I'm not saying that doesn't exist. I'm just saying, here's a list of my beliefs. That is not on my list. Whatever it is. But you might not lack a belief, depending on whether or not it. Well, I'm not going to affirm a belief until it's defined. Right. But, I mean, it might not be true that all the time you were saying you lacked the belief, you actually didn't lack a belief. It's just that because you didn't know what it was, you just thought you lacked a belief, but you really did Well, okay. Didn't. Well, that's your job to explain what that it is. Okay. Then. Oh, that's, that's fine. I just want to make sure I was clear on that. I, I'm just curious, and, and this is a way of trying to get at the metaphysics. By the way, uh, well, we'll uh, uh, let me take these one at a time. You... you how would you respond to my accusation where when you said these things like they're just concepts, they're not things, okay, it's pretty much that as you were describing. How would you define, how would you respond to my claim that that's a false dilemma because you're, you're either assuming a Platonist or an alchemist view of those things that I listed like in, intellect and humanity. So why couldn't, why wouldn't you be why couldn't Aristotle's middle ground between Plato and Occam serve to give a coherent notion of these things that you say are not things, they're merely concepts? Well, 
I suppose you can say anything you want, but intelligence is, can you point to intelligence? Can you buy it at the store? Can no, you? No, but don't, uh, maybe I'm not clear. When you say, can you point to intelligence? Can you buy it at a store? That's assuming a Platonist type of answer to what these things are. And you say, no, they're not those things, because obviously I can't go buy an intelligence. I would agree with you. But that's because I'm not a Platonist. But it doesn't follow, or what would you say from my accusation? It doesn't follow from that that they're just merely concepts. Because all you've done is just say, since Plato is wrong, which I agree with you he's, he is in this regard, it doesn't follow that Occam is right. Why, why wouldn't Aristotle's view of that serve you? Well, I think we can define something like intelligence as a description of a function. So if you want to say function exists, like a computer functions, you can say, yeah, that function is existing, but the function itself is not a thing. It's a word in our brain. So if you want to agree that there are somehow, is somehow a metaphysical existence to a concept in a mind, well, that's a diff totally different debate because it's all <clears throat> only happening in our mind. When you turn off the computer, that whatever intelligence goes, it's not there. Uh, the computer's there, but the functioning of it is a word that we describe for intelligence or, or whatever, whatever group word or, or label we want to put on things that actually don't exist as physical entities. Exactly. If you can find some other way that they exist, then you have to make a case for that. Some yeah, well, that's what I would, I would submit to you that if, 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 if you haven't already done so, it, I would, let me say it more positively, I would very much be interested in how you would rebut Aristotle's view about what these things are, because your rebuttal to me was predicated on a false assumption that there's either the choice that is Plato's understanding or Occam's understanding. And I think that's the problem, I think it's the problem I've seen in a lot of atheists, I don't mean this against you personally, just in terms of the literature, is they seem to have an abject ignorance of this classical moderate realism from the Aristotelian tradition. So every time the arguments get leveled, it's, well, obviously Plato's wrong here, so it has to be Occam, and I go, well, wait a minute. What about Aristotle and Aquinas? They had a totally different model that gives a coherent understanding of things like humanity without it being silly like, well, you can go to store and buy a humanity. So I'm just curious as to why wouldn't that be a plausible response, perhaps? Well, okay, but then we're still dealing in the realm of concepts. No, no, no. You're saying, yeah, if we deal with Aristotle, we're still, it still boils down to Occam. I'm asking, no, I'm it not saying it's it boils. Different. I'm saying we're dealing with concepts. No, we're concepts not. Concepts are... are useful things in our brains. Okay, well, if, I'm, if I'm you suggesting think, to you we're not dealing merely with concepts. So if you concepts. think something like humanity is a, what, a half physical truth, you can go, you know, it's some kind of a weird in-between fuzzy... No, uh, it's, it's just that you need to read Aristotle to get the idea. I mean, I can't, get, I can't summarize it right now. But it, I'm just suggesting there's this rich, robust tradition. Maybe it's wrong, too. I'm just saying there's this incredibly thick, robust tradition, 2,300 years old, that many atheists seem to have no concept of. And I'm curious why that's the case. Well, I would wonder how many of this audience initially came to their faith in God as a result of contemplating Aristotle's metaphysics. I don't think that's really relevant to anything about okay. whether this being, you think God is a real thing, not just a concept. You think he's an actually existing thing. Yes. So I don't know if, if Aristotle is even relevant to that. It's, yes, it's, he's it's absolutely a, relevant to that. All right. It's a good right. mind game. We're, we're turning the tables now. Now, Dan, you've got seven minutes uh, asking Richard questions, and just like he stopped you, you can stop him anytime you want to keep okay. him moving. Go ahead, sir. So the, the Bible says God is a spirit. Yes. What is a spirit? I think spirit in that context, what Jesus means is God is substantial existence itself. What? I think in that context, what Jesus means by saying God is spirit is that God is substantial existence itself. Substantial existence. Then does he occupy space? Does he have weight? Does he have light refraction? Does he, does he move around as a physical existing thing? No. Is that what Jesus... Well, then what is the spirit? Fear, spirit, I think, is substantial existence itself. So what is, ex, what is it for something to exist? Is it, I would try to press someone to go, do you think that a thing that is existing, that there's something about that thing that's different from something that's not existing? And what is that difference? It's not the essence, because there's lots of essences that don't exist. Like Sherlock Holmes has a human essence. 
We can, we can argue, you know, you say things, all of, we know a lot, everything we want to know about Sherlock Holmes because he's a human being. But he doesn't have existence. He's not a real thing. He's just a conceptual being in well, this Well, I think regard. you just made my point for me. So. Which was? I, for, I missed that. What did I do? Well, then God's existence is not a real thing either. It's a fictional character. Who no, I'm can... saying he's substantial existence. Is that the definition of the word spirit? Substantial? Yes, substance. I think so. The word substance means physical, material. The word substance no, is a... Yes, it does. No, it doesn't. Yes, it does. The word substance means physical material. You can't have a... a yeah, unless no, you're talking conceptually All about, I can suggest to you is just read some Aristotle. Well, why don't you explain he's, it then? He's a, well, don't, I would love to. In fact, I, I tell you what, I, let Aristotle. me take you up on that. I will explain it because I start a class Monday I would love for you to take. I think the seminary would let you take it for free. It's, a, it's called Classical Philosophy, where I carry the students from the ancient Greeks up to just after the Middle Ages to explain these things. Now, you may decide, okay, well, it really doesn't help your case. That's fine. But I submit to you, you don't know about this tradition. I don't mean this disrespectfully. That it really is a philosophical tradition that's never come on your radar screen. That's why it sounds like to you there is no good evidence because you, you've never heard Aristotle, Aristotelian, Thomistic answer. Yes, that's, I, I mean, I've, I've read enough about it in philosophy books. Without having, I'm not as smart as you, obviously. Well, I don't know I'm not that. as well educated as you, but I've read enough about Aristotle to know it's just concepts, basically. But uh, the Bible says God is a spirit. In other words, God is made up of spirit. Spirit is something that is not God because <clears throat> demons can be spirits, angels can be spirits, right? Other things can be spirits. So what is do demons have substantial existence? I mean, you know what I'm saying? What yeah. actually is it? There's a difference between something having existence and something being existence itself. That's what my argument was trying to, to assert, at least. That there's a difference between a thing's essence, its whatness, and its existence, its being, its act of being. There's a distinction there. My argument was, it couldn't be the case that, or let me say it from the other direction, if there's anything that exists whose essence is not existence itself, it could only exist because there is a current. It wasn't true that I denied a current cause. I denied that the class of these uh, popular arguments don't, can't account for a current cause. My argument was there has to be at every moment that we're existing and a being that is existence itself that is causing us to have existence. That's what the art. So there's a difference between the substantial. We're almost out of time existence. here. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, I, I know you didn't have enough time to talk about my Bible criticisms, but I just want to ask you okay. a, a, a simple question: Is genocide good? It depends on what you mean by good. So I don't want to sign, uh, you know, a, 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 a contract without knowing the, the the terms of the contract. Does, so we may not have a same I, understanding. I defined of what, good as the intention to avoid harm. Yeah, I, would, I wouldn't say that's what good is. I really? Have, well, what is good then if it's not that? Well, I, I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to try to answer that. <clears throat> you causing harm? I Ca think genocide is good? Well, you can give me a multiple choice, and if you get to the one I have, I'll be glad to. That's it. You're, you notice he's not denying that genocide is good. He's yeah, hedging. Look, look, no, at how, look at how theologians and apologists yeah, defend no. this monster in the Bible. You're, you're not right. denying. I, Why don't you say genocide is bad? Genocide is evil. Why can't you say that? Well, I thought it was clear why I couldn't say that. I can say that if we can agree on what those words mean. I just, all I was trying to do, Dan, was I don't know what you understand good to be. It may be my fault. I don't understand enough by what you mean by good, so I don't want to taste the risk of going, oh, no, I don't think it's good, and then you can turn around and leverage that against me. So let me answer your other question that you've already asked that I didn't give me a chance to answer. Well, then what is good? I would argue that what it means for a thing to be good is that it exemplifies all the perfections that it ought to have by virtue of being the kind of thing that it is. So, uh, for example, a good knife has a sharp blade. That's why it wouldn't make any sense to go, well, you wouldn't, well, who are you to say, uh, you wouldn't say this, who are you to say that a knife ought to have a sharp blade? That's just what it is to be a knife. We talk about good knives, good pizzas, good cars, and good people. So a good person is a human being who exemplifies all the perfections of what it is to be human. That's what a good human is. Now, moral good is something other than, it's a subset of that, but I think that's what good means. So. 
in, in, in many instances, these kind of atrocities that you, that you list you from the Bible and otherwise, they are atrocities. they're not goods for that thing. Absolutely not. You, if a lion tears off of guy's arm, that's not good for them. So when the Israelites invaded a Canaanite town and took a sword and they cut off the heads of two-year-olds and they ripped open pregnant women and they destroyed and burned and killed everybody... That could be good. No, it's not mind. a good at all, at least for not for the Canaanites it wasn't. Well, God did it. God That's commanded right. God it. God did it, but it was not a good for them. So God is not good. No, that doesn't follow. Plus, what I, what I suspect is you're conflating good and moral good. So it doesn't follow that if God causes something to happen to someone that's not a good for that person, at least not in the short term then it doesn't follow from that that the act that God did was itself not moral good or whatever. That's, that may be true, but that requires a further argument really? precisely because this distinction gets muddled. Really? And you're actually yeah, because, saying this. But listen, Dan, I'm not saying anything here that hasn't been the most, probably one of the most prevalent theories of good and morality in Western history. Can you see then why someone like me would find that kind of an argument utterly despicable? No. Defending this being... By saying that he can decide what is good or not? No, I can't. What, that, I, what baffles me is why you... Can, well, it, this doesn't baffle me. Killing babies, ripping open pregnant women. Right. That is bad. That is it not is certainly good. bad and for God the babies. God commanded it and God but did it. But it doesn't follow that it's a moral bad without further argument. Because you're conflating good and... For example, if you have a knife that has a dull blade, that's a bad knife, but it's not a morally bad knife. It's not immoral to have a black, bad gla ba uh, uh, a dull blade, right? Just in principle, I mean, as an illustration. So there's a difference between good and bad and moral good and bad. And because those distinctions aren't carefully teased out, people just make these accusations and think these things follow when they just don't follow. But I'm only talking about moral good here. That's all I'm talking about. No, you're moral not. good. I mean, no, you, we you have weren't. moral. That's not what you asked me. You asked me what I thought good was. You didn't ask me what I thought Is moral good was. Is genocide a moral good? Uh, it could be. It could be. I mean, say that again. Let me make sure I followed your question. Just make sure. So I don't. I'm, I'm, I, I don't want to make. Sure, I want to make sure I don't say something I don't mean. Could genocide be a moral good? All right. What do you think a moral good is? And I'll tell you whether I think it can be what you think it is or not. A moral good is acting with the intention as much as possible to minimize real harm in the real world, not well, to that, hurt. Uh, not if to harm. If that's all good is, no, it's not. If that's what moral that's good what is, moral good is. I say. I'm just answering your question. If that's not what it is then no, it's not a moral good, because that's just true by definition. If a moral good is to minimize the, uh, these harm, and then I, I, you give me an example of something that maximizes harm, and then you ask me, is that a moral good? Oh, well, of course not. If that's what moral good is, and you give me a simple example of something that's not a moral good, then no, it's not a moral good. The question is, is that or is that not a moral good? That's where the question, and whether it is or isn't a moral good presupposes a question of, is it, is it a good? All, all I'm suggesting is these things are quite a bit, not even quite a bit, they're just a little bit more nuanced and complicated than many atheists that I've read want them to be. And they just collapse everything into these convenient, you know, categories. I'm not suggesting you're doing this, but they, can, they collapse these things into oversimplified categories and then they just demand an answer. Oh, well, you can't do an answer. Let's move on and all become well, tell that. Tell that to the three-year-old who's... But see, that's, a, that's a different question. That, that's a tactic. That's the that's same a pastoral, question. No, it's not. That's a pastoral question. That's not a metaphysical question. All right. Um, I don't know if it was morally good or not, but we went over time there. So maybe you guys can hash it out. Now, we're going to go to Q&A from the audience, and we'll ask a question of each uh, debater for about 20 minutes. We'll go back and forth, and if you could keep your answers to two minutes or less, and... If, you'd, if the other person would like to respond for one minute, that's fine. We'll start with a question for uh, Dan. Dan, uh, this question comes from an SES graduate, John Ferrer. The question is, why, according to nature, should we not harm each other? We are perfectly able to harm each other. We may like or dislike harm. But since all those happen in nature, why should we pick the harmless behaviors as, quote, good, unquote, instead of the harmful ones? It seems nature has no moral fact-making property, property to identify one as good and the other as evil. 
Yeah, well, that's wrong. Nature does have the moral faculty and the fact that we evolved as moral animals. We evolved as social animals with instincts to compassion and empathy and altruism, with instincts to avoid naturally recoiling from harm. So it's, it's amazing that somebody would even have to ask that question. Because harm, by definition, is not good. We avoid it. We try to get away from harm. And if you have to ask, well, how, how, why couldn't harm be good? Well, you're just de redefining what good means. So I, I know there's gray areas. I mean, we all agree that we, it's really not a good thing to take a needle and poke it into a baby. Unless that baby needs a life-saving injection, then we will cause some temporary harm for a greater good. We will cause some harm. You might have to have an amputation or you might have to do something. You might have to go south a little while before you can go north again. But if your intention is to end up with a world with less real harm in it, that's what morality means. Morality is not obeying orders or following commandments. Morality is trying, it's the basic golden rule. It's basically trying to enhance the well-being and the success of any sentient organism on this planet without causing unnecessary harm to that to that being. Dr. Howe, response? Well, uh, I don't know. Maybe I've, I've said enough about the topic. I just would su uh, suggest the audience to just, if you, I'm going to share some uh, resources a little bit later, and perhaps uh, Dan has some resources he suggests for, for, for further reason. But notice he uses the word intention. I would, I would love to hear what in the world is an intention. Is it just a concept? And if it's a concept, why is it related to what determines whether something is moral or not? Because in the literature, by and large, intentions are non-material. They're not things. They're, Im they're aspects of immaterial intellects. So it's curious to me that, uh, and, and I just think this is almost dispositional. It's not intentional. That, that a lot of these atheists just traffic in all of these categories that they have no uh, access to because their view of the nature of reality either hasn't even commented on those things, like I wouldn't even know Aristotle's view as opposed to Plato versus Occam, or they, they just summarily ignore them uh, in some other respect. Okay, next question is for uh, Dr. Howe. If God is like the first gear in your anti kalam argument, does God not have to be actively turning and interacting with his creation? And if he does, how can he choose to not interact fully when it comes to stopping evil? Explain God's withholding of his omnipotence to stop evil if he has to constantly interact with his creation like that ever-turning first gear. Yeah, I'm, I think, uh, I mean, I'm hoping I'm understanding the question. I mean, of course, you realize the gear thing is just an, an analogy, just a physical picture of the, of the, uh, the uh, point I'm making metaphysically that things that are existing, that are in the process of existing as an act right at this instant, if that doesn't arise out of the fact that they are existence, it must be because something is causing them to exist at every moment, who, who, which itself is existing by virtue of its very nature. That, that, that's all that illustration of the gear was trying to prove. Now, what one might want to go on to say regarding God interacting with his creation and these kind of things, I think a lot of times the, the, uh, the language is fraught with just the failure to appreciate the, uh, the role of analogical language when we're trying to talk about how God acts and things. All we can do is extrapolate from what we experience in the physical world by doing philosophical reasoning to think what we are trying to say about what we think God is like. So I don't think he, he interacts, I only say it this way, I don't think God co constantly causing the existence of the universe is an example of interaction, in, especially not in the sense in which the gear would interact, quote unquote, with the other, other gears. Now why that's the case, take my classical philosophy course. It starts Monday. It's still not too late for anybody to sign up for it. You can audit the class if you don't want to take it for credit. And we go and we spend 40 hours meticulously going through. You might decide you don't like the categories. You don't agree with Aristotle and Aquinas. Fine. But I think you owe it to yourself before you pull the trigger between either theism or atheism that you at least acquaint yourself with, with one of the longest enduring philosophical traditions in Western civilization before you make your up your mind. If I have to sit through 40 hours of your philosophy class before I know God exists, then uh, I don't think so. That's fine. That's up to you. There's other, you know, if God exists, he will, he will reveal himself to me. I don't need you 
You're a very smart guy. Thank you. I know you are, and you're very um, articulate. But I don't need you to tell me something. You're just one guy with an opinion. I, I was just wanting to right? teach it to you was all. I wasn't going to, I mean, I'm just a teacher. <laughs> all right. Dan, back to you for a question more. Uh, getting a lot of questions on morality here. Science can describe morality, but it cannot prescribe morality. So if we are just matter in motion, why say that we should not harm humans if we have no value? We do have value. As human beings, we have intrinsic value. Every organism has intrinsic value. I have some little chipmunk friends in the backyard, and I think each one of those has intrinsic value as chipmunks. And they're, they're becoming friends of mine, actually. But um, um, morality is not something you prescribe. <clears throat> morality is conditional. And value is conditional. We evolved to, to, to need water, right? We need water. And if I give you water because you're thirsty, well, that's a good act. What if we evolved to need arsenic? Well, that's different. It depends on how we, how we got to be the way we are. So what I would say is that if you want to end up with a world that has less violence in it, if you want to end up in a world that has more peace and more love and more safety, then you will act in ways to minimize harm. And that's what being moral is. We don't have to. Cosmically, there's no cosmic prescription that we have to love each other. In fact, there are some people who are sick. There are some sociopaths and psychopaths in our population. Four percent, by the way, are, so, are sociopathic, who are ill, whose minds aren't working. They, they lack that empathy circuit. But basically, most of us fall somewhere in the middle. And we understand what it means. You don't have to take 40 hours of a class to understand what it means to love your kids and love your neighbors and to be a good, decent human being. That's a basic part of who we are. And if you're one of those few people that does want to destroy, if you're the psychopath that doesn't want to go and shoot down a country music concert, then we have laws and we have measures of, of self-defense and protection to try to protect ourselves from people like that so that we can live in a safer world. So remember, my philosophy about morality is bottom-up. It comes from our human physical nature with basic real harm in the real world. It's not a top-down command kind of morality. It's a practical morality. How can we live in this world bumping into the, all the harms that are there and, and get through it with the least amount of violence and harm that we can? Okay, Dr. Howe, respond. Yeah, you know, I think there's some respects in which that some of the things that I read in contemporary atheists uh, is not as far off from what classical natural law theory would have said in terms of the initial observation. I agree with Dan that you don't have to have a Bible to tell you that it's wrong to kill another human being. Now, I may, it may startle a lot of Christians here, but I agree that that's true. I think what is right or wrong is by and large something that is knowable by reason. What what, what we do from there, though, is try to begin to show, but this is what has to be true about the nature of reality in order for, that, for what we already know to be the case, namely that it's wrong to do X, Y, and Z, for it to be that way. Those things aren't God. That we have, I, that's not my argument. Well, we have to have God in order to know. I don't think that's true. I think what we do have to commit ourselves to are certain metaphysical truths like natures, like causality, like essence. And, and that is what has made purchase of what it means for something to be good or evil for a human being. Free will, for example, rationality. And I think, I can't do it here, that if you take those metaphysical truths that, that account for what our moral experience actually is, those metaphysical truths, when properly arranged, prove that God exists. It's the same metaphysical ingredients that comprise the classical argument for God's existence. Staying on the topic of good, Dr. Howe, how does the existence of a being whose essence is existence imply that the being is good and should be trusted? How do we know that this being isn't evil? Let me suggest a reading and then give you my short answer. So if you're not satisfied with my short answer, it's because uh, you, you just need a little bit more background. Go to my website, richardghow.com. Go to the resources tab, click on papers, and scroll down to the paper by Jan Arts entitled The Convertibility of Being and Good in St. Thomas Aquinas. Because what, what Aquinas will argue, I agree with, is that ultimately being existence and good 
are convertible terms. They're the same thing. Being as being just is good. And Artson will show how that works out in terms of, well, there seems to be a lot of beings that aren't good and those kind of objections and stuff. So given these and the other things that I won't take time to go into, it, it follows necessarily that a, be, that a being who just is being itself is, is infinite goodness. It just, that's just what goodness and being, they're just convertible. They're called the transcendentals in, in Aristotle. Now, the details of all that obviously are, I'm not, can't do in two minutes. So it's not fair to, hey, I'm, I'm with you, Hal, you know, let's, let's go. But I would, you know, before you pull the trigger and go, well, that just sounds absurd, read Artson's article and just see what you think about the argument. I mean, that seems like a, a fairly safe thing to ask people to do. On the other hand, no. <laughs> Dan, how can humans rely on any concepts of good, harm, or morality when human beings are products of meaningless and undirected processes of evolution? What reason do we have to believe that our reasoning facul faculties are reliable and objectively true if we're just the products of a random, meaningless process? So those are two questions in one. Um, in my book, Life Driven Purpose, and I think you'll get the title of that book, uh, where I answer Rick Warren's um, Purpose Driven Life, I point out that just because there's no meaning of life, there's no purpose of life, that's actually a good thing that there's no purpose of life and no meaning of life in the cosmos. The cosmos doesn't care about us. Someday we're all going to be extinct. No one's going to remember us or this building or even this planet someday. The fact that there is no meaning of life or purpose of life does not mean there's no meaning in life. Instead of top-down, like purpose-driven life, really meaning is bottom-up, life-driven purpose. And meaning and purpose come in our lives from solving problems. When you have a problem in life that you're trying to solve, that gives you meaning. It could be avoiding harm, or it could be creating beauty, or it could be doing science, or it could be whatever it is. When you have a task and a problem that you're solving, you have bottom-up meaning in your life, which is much more important and much more precious than any meaning of life. So it doesn't come from the cosmos. It comes from the fact that we are struggling, surviving biological organisms that are trying to make a living and get by and reproduce with the least amount of harm and the most amount of success as possible. And there is me immense meaning in our life. Uh, reason is just a, a label for the functioning of one of the tools of the brain. It's just a word that we made up. Reason is not a thing in the cosmos. It's just, it's just a way our brain is working. And it doesn't even have to, it's not some transcendent logic of some big capital L thing out there. It's a word that we have made up as human beings to describe the successful ways that our brains are actually functioning to compare alternatives and to look at concepts. So you don't need some external transcendent explanation for reason and logic. What you need is a bottom-up functioning explanation of how our brains are actually working. Dr. Howe. Well, there's that false dilemma again. See, we don't need a transcendent explanation. We need a bottom-up. I go, well, that's because you're either thinking that you, it either is Plato or Occam. That's the problem. I'm curious as to how an atheist would even understand the word meaning. What is, that, what is meaning? Is that just a, uh, well, what is meaning? Second, I, I'm very, it seems to me that he more or less just admitted that he didn't have reason. If reason is just the function of the brain, then what, that's like saying, well, then, you know, freezing is just the function of water when it reaches a certain temperature, or rolling is the function of this. There's different functions. So why all of a sudden is the function of a brain why does that even, why does it even, why should that have anything to do with anything else that's real? That'd be like saying, if we just gave the word reason to what, what happens when this pen rolls down a hill, but instead of call it rolling, we call it reason, then somebody go, well, I don't think believing in God is reasonable. Well, what does that even mean? What do you mean? They're, they're believing in the existence of God is rolling down the hill of this pen. Oh, no, no, what I mean is it's not reasonable in your brain. But all you're saying there is it's just a function of these chemicals in your brain. Well, what's the difference between that as just a physical function and this pen rolling? 
There's no, it's no more meaningful cognitively to say that I have good reasons for being a, an atheist or lacking a belief in God than I have good pins rolling down the hill for being an atheist or lacking the belief of God because they're just different kinds of physical functions. Dr. Howe, to follow up on the last question, uh, what attributes would the necessarily existing essence you argued for have, given your argument? Anything other than it exists and causes everything else to exist? Well, the short answer to that is it, it will have all of the superlative classical attributes that have been the dominant view of the nature of God throughout the history of the church. Now, I'm not suggesting because that's been the dominant view that that's why they're true. But there is a reason why theologians and philosophers have ascribed to God things like omnipotence, omniscience, omnipresence, personal, good. There's a reason why all those things, even if they're wrong in doing it, the reasons have to do, by and large, with the metaphysics that lie behind it. Now, I would just say, if a person's going to challenge those as being true or as even being coherent, first of all, it's just absurd to say on the face of it that an omniscient being can't be free or an omnipotent being can't be free. And when I read Michael Martin and these academic atheists, they have an abject ignorance about what omnipotence and omniscience even means in the classical tradition. That's not even what those words mean. They have as far as I can tell from what I, what, he, what I read, they have no clue what we're even saying when we say these things about God. Now, maybe we're still wrong. That's fine. You can say that, but not for the reasons you got. It isn't because of these facile kinds of things. Well, if you're omnipotent, then you would be able to do the opposite of what you're doing. Or if you're omniscient, you couldn't be free because you would know what you would do tomorrow and you wouldn't have the power to... Those things... All of those things all arise out of this abject ignorance about the metaphysics of what we're saying about God. That if there's a being whose essence is existence itself, once we understand what existence is, we find that that being must have all of these superlative attributes. That's what that is. And I can suggest some readings on that. In fact, I will during my closing. I'll respond briefly. Um, what you're saying basically is by definition. It's not by observation. But my next book that's coming out in February is, is about free will, and I talk about these concepts. In order to have free will, whether you think we have it or not, that's a big debate in philosophy. And uh, even atheists disagree about that, and even theologians do. Uh, Martin Luther disagreed with um, um, John Calvin. Well, Calvin, and I think, I think Aquinas too. But in, in any event, uh, whatever you think about free will, it involves having options. You have to be able to say, oh, I can choose this or that or more than one option. And some philosophers call that, uh, you have latitude, right? If you only have one choice, then what's the free will, right? So you have to have options. But that means that you can't know your future decision. If you know your future decision, you don't have any options because it's already determined in advance. So if you know the future, you can't have and you don't have free will because if your future decision is known in advance by your omniscient mind then between now and then you can't change that you don't have any latitude you don't have any ability to say oh I'm gonna change my mind and if you do change your mind then you weren't omniscient in the first place so the f having omniscience about your own future decisions God I'm talking about not just humans if God knows his own future decisions then that puts limits on his power, doesn't it? Right now, today, he can't change today what he knows he's going to do tomorrow. So a being who, who knows the future does not and cannot logically have free will. I call that fang, the free will argument for the non-existence of God. Last question uh, for each of you. First question for you, Dan. What would change your mind for you to believe in God? What would, what would you have to see? What evidence would you have to see? What would cause you to say there is a God? Yeah, so atheism is exquisitely vulnerable to disproof. We would, we would, we would immediately change our minds, right? As I said earlier, I'm not fighting the concept. If it's there, I want to know it, right? It, it would be pretty amazing to know that there's this being up there, and I would like to know that. So we, we don't, we're not like saying, no, no, I'm not going to believe. Um, there are thousands of things that could change my mind or could at least increase the probability that such a being exists. For example, the Bible tells 
you believers, whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer believing, all things you shall receive. It doesn't say maybe. It says all things whatsoever ye shall ask, you shall receive. That's an absolute statement in the Bible. So if Richard were to ask God to tell him something that's going to happen tomorrow, for example, if God told Richard that tomorrow at 12.13 and 17 seconds an asteroid from the south-southeast at an angle of 87 degrees were to hit the earth with a velocity of so many miles per second and were to end up seven inches below my basement after going through an Navajo rug and that is composed of 92% iron and 1% iridium and so on and then it weighs this many ounces. If, if God were to tell you that, and he could, right? He knows everything. And he tells you that he will answer everything you ask. If you were to do that, and if tomorrow at 1217 that actually happened, wow, I would say, all right, all right. Now, there's, there's something there, right? I mean, if, if your prayers were actually answered in a scientifically significant way, I would have to say, oops, I might be wrong here. But so far, we don't see that. Richard, what would cause you to believe there is no God, what, would, what change would you need to see? I like these questions because in my experiences in debates, and I haven't done as many debates as Dan has, but uh, this question comes up pretty often. And so I thought about this and because I think it's a fair question to ask. I think there is a meaningful sense in which certain kinds of theories or beliefs about reality can, can be rendered meaningless if they're unfalsifiable. If nothing could count as evidence against your belief, then there, at least in the, in the scientific sense, there's really no, your belief doesn't pick out anything. Philosophical beliefs are a little bit trickier uh, in terms of falsification because the principle of falsifiability is itself not falsifiable. So right there we've got some kind of problem. But nevertheless, I've thought about this, and I think that what would begin to uh, mitigate my confidence that God existed, at least let's say the God that I think exists, the classical God of the God of classical theism, is if somehow I began to believe that logic didn't really apply to reality, that contradiction, contradictions maybe could both be true. And in some forms of, say, mysticism, I've, I've, I've read of people who have had certain types of mystical experiences or drug experiences, and then they come out with this a less of ability to, they actually has mitigated their belief in the rationality and the sort of normal sense of the term, logic and reason, that it actually applies. This is sort of Wittgenstein's view in, in the early Wittgenstein in the Tractatus. He ends the Tractatus. He has seven propositions in the Tractatus. The last proposition is something to the effect, uh, that about which we cannot speak, thereof we must remain silent. And he thought that there was this sort of or at least some people would interpret it, that there's sort of a, some kind of realm that's beyond our ability to think logically and reasonably, and we really can't talk about it. I think I know enough of Vic, what Wittgenstein was getting at to know, well, whatever he thought that realm was, it bore no resemblance whatsoever to what I believe is a classical theist. So if I came persuaded that maybe Wittgenstein was onto something, as a lot of Buddhist philosophy has done, then I think that would probably begin to erode my belief in classical theism if I could be disabused of my, my belief that, log, that reality is logical. All right, it's time for closing statements, and uh, Dr. Howe will go first with a five-minute closing statement. Uh, thank everyone for your questions. Obviously, we couldn't get to all of them, uh, but we tried to uh, ask questions that were based on the topics they had discussed during the debate. Continue to talk awkwardly amongst yourselves, as Dr. House Thank says, you. as he hooks this thing up yes, here. Yes, this is the time to talk awkwardly among ourselves here. Thank While you, we're sir. waiting, I, I want everyone to uh, realize that this particular debate was sponsored by the American Family Association, AFA.net. Hundred and eighty six stations around the country. They have an app, they have a website, AFA.net. Check them out there. They carry many of our podcasts. So check out AFA. And here's Dr. Howe. Well, let me conclude the, or at least begin my conclusion. That sounds like a contradiction. Thanking uh, all of you for being here tonight. So God bless all of you, uh, and if you're here and you're a skeptic and you want to continue the conversation, we're at a Christian event, so there are tons of people here that love to continue the conversation. I want to thank Dan 
uh, for his professionalism and his, uh, his uh, passion about these kind of issues. And I appreciate his carving out the time to come all the way down here to Charlotte and doing that. So all of us do very much appreciate your, your, uh, your demeanor in this regard and such. So thank you for that. And then, of course, all the people that put this on, Adam, on down, Frank, thanks for moderating. And, uh, and so just I appreciate it. Let me just uh, let you know how you can get some, some uh, resources that I'm going to. If you go to my website, that was worth coming tonight just to see that animation. Uh, and you'll go to richardghow.com, and you'll see at the top a resources tab. So you click on that tab, and it'll take you to four choices. What you're interested in is PDF decks. And that will be a, basically a PDF of the slides that you saw and then some, since we didn't have time to do them all. So you can actually go and get all of these. They're from the courses that I teach here. You're especially interested in the debate with Dan Barker uh, here tonight. So I invite you to get that. And you can have any of the other uh, PDF decks that you want. Although I want to warn you, some of the PDF decks might not make sense as you look at it if you didn't hear the lecture that went along with it. So it's tempted me to uh, maybe stick a slide in there with a picture on it that has nothing to do with anything. Just so somebody will come up to me and go, you know, I was reading your argument for God's existence. Uh, exactly what is that kumquat argument for God's existence you've got in there? Well, that sounds really interesting to me. So, well, let me suggest a few resources as, as we uh, wind this up. First of all, there are a number of debates in print. Terry Meathy, I uh, had a debate with Anthony Flew uh, titled, Does God Exist? A Believer in an Atheist Debate. So I like these kind of things in print, kind of what we did tonight and stuff. By the way, you may find it interesting that Anthony Flew went on to become a theist. I don't know that he ever became a Christian, uh, so maybe deist might be a better term. But uh, he wrote a book called, There Is a God, How the World's Most Notorious Atheist Changed His Mind. Interestingly, his book is his picture upside down, as you, as you see there. So I think that's a good one. Another debate I would highly recommend is a debate between J.P. Moreland and Kai Nielsen called, Does God Exist? I actually helped organize this debate as a, debate as a little tiny graduate student at Ole Miss back in 19... 19- <coughs> Then some more uh, sort of intermediate level books. Again, Dr. Moreland has one of the best single volume apologetics books from, from the, uh, uh, along the way, present company accepted because Frank Turek's book, which I'll get to in a moment. But I like J.P. Moreland's Scaling the Secular City. I like Edward Fazer's The Last Superstition, Refutation of New Atheism. It's a little heavy handed, but he explains why as he is. So I don't want you to be put off. You need to get Stealing from God by Dr. Frank Turek. I'd also highly recommend Jim Wallace's God's Crime Scene. They're all, they're both dealing specifically with this issue. And then more advanced study for those of you who want your 200 proof. Probably the best book on this subject that I've read in my recent memory in years is Gavin Kerr's book, Aquinas' Way to God, The, the Proof in the Day into Edessentia. That's the proof I gave to you tonight, although the version I gave to you tonight was my own before I read his book, so I don't want you to prejudge what he's going to argue. It is, if, it is tremendous, philosophically speaking. A book that I've just started reading uh, I think Edward Fazer is one of the most articulate living philosoph- philosophers today, especially philosophers of religion. In his book, Five Proofs of the uh, Existence of God, Aristotle, Plotinus, Augustine, Aquinas, and Leibniz. A good book on the attributes of God is James Dolezal's All That Is in God. And then I mentioned Joseph Owens earlier, his book, St. Thomas Aquinas on the Existence of God, The Collected Papers of Joseph Owens. I don't mean this against Dan personally. I just mean this generically. I defy any philosophical atheist to read Joseph Owens and still sustain their atheism philosophically. Because you read people like Owens and you will find out why it is absurd to think that free will is somehow preempted by omniscience. They just don't understand what classical theism is even saying in the first place. And I think that's that's true. And probably uh, the most thorough in terms of some of this stuff is uh, Maurice Holloway. An interesting thing about Maurice Holloway is he really was blurry in real life. (laughs) So this is actually a good picture of a really blurry guy. No, no, that's not true. That's a joke. In his book, uh, An Introduction to Natural Theology. So if you want to talk afterwards, uh, I'll be hanging around. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Dan Barker. (laughs) 
So this is an apologetics conference. In 1 Peter 3, believers are told, always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting or a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet, do it with gentleness and reverence. I think Richard has been a very gentle person tonight, so that's one good mark in your favor. Apologetics, <laughs> apologetics only works if I'm coming to you. Your need to evangelize does not translate into my need to listen to you. First, I have to respect you. And how can I do that when your book, the Bible, is not reliable? Here's an example. Psalm 14 says, The fool hath said in his heart, There is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. They are filthy. What a cruel slander that is. Atheists have indeed done good things. We're not filthy and abominable. This uncharitable passage in the Bible is clearly incorrect and should be ripped out of any decent book. It's an ad hominem that's just unfair and cruel. If you talk to me like that, I'm not going to listen to you. I've got other friends to talk with. If you want to have a meaningful conversation with us atheists, then talk to us like equals. Don't condescend. Don't call us fools. Don't assume that we atheists are living lives of despair. You hear that from the pulpits a lot. Nihilism or hopelessness. Don't assume that we lack love and joy in our lives. That we are fearful of death. Just because we don't share your hope doesn't mean our lives lack immense value. Don't assume that we're angry or guilty or that we lack moral guidance in our lives. Don't assume that we don't know how to read the Bible. Mark Twain said, it ain't those parts of the Bible that I can't understand that bother me. It's the parts that I do understand. Who made you the authority on, what, on how to interpret the Bible? If the Bible can only be understood after it's explained by scholars and experts, then God is inept. He failed to speak clearly. And don't threaten us with hell. Come on. Any system of thought that is based on violence, that's what hell is. It's a violent threat. It's a morally bankrupt system. It's the daddy who says, you're a bad little boy. You do what I say or I will punish you. Christianity is toddler morality. So what's the real problem here? Why do we disagree so radically? Richard and I are both good people. You want truth. I want truth. Why? Is it because I'm blind or something? Is there something wrong with me? Well, if I can be blind, so can you. I think this whole debate comes down to our view of human nature. Jesus said, they who are healthy don't need the doctor, only they who are sick. So there you go. You Christians view yourself as sick, depraved sinners who need the doctor. We atheists don't see ourselves that way. We are healthy. We don't need the salvation or the answer. How much respect would you have for a doctor who runs around cutting people with a knife so that he can sell them a Band-Aid? It's a phony solution to a phony problem. You are the ones with a negative and pessimistic view of human nature. My view is positive, optimistic, and hopeful. I have confidence in the potential of reason and science and human kindness. It's not perfect, but it's better than fear and faith. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge. Fear is an emotion. Your worldview is emotional. We non-believers, on the other hand, are unafraid to tell it like it is. We think you should put away childish things and develop some adult bravery and tell your daddy that he screwed up. In order to appease his jealous wrath, he has to kill things? Is that good? I think we're better than that. We atheists have grown up. We've moved out of the house of the abusive, controlling father. Like the American patriots who fought a revolutionary war, kicking the king, the lord, the master out of our lives, we are proudly rebellious. When the black cat was walking away from me this morning, I said, hey, you're not really real, are you? You exist only in my mind. He turned around and looked at me, and then he disappeared. When I said the same thing to God, he also disappeared. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, I want to give uh, Richard and Dan another round of applause. And uh, if you gentlemen would would you head out to the lobby right now before they go, in case they want to talk to you, just a photo. We need a photo. Adam has a photo. By the way, while Adam's taking a photo, you need to give Adam a round of applause because he put this whole thing together, ladies and gentlemen. Adam Tucker right here. We need a photo. Get a photo, Adam. Please, just, just hang on one second so they can leave. And you too. And you too. Okay. Can you do like this? This is good. This is good. Okay, which one of these is not like the other? <laughs> All right. They're going to go down... They're going to go down to the lobby in case you want to ask them a few more questions. Yeah, go right now. Go right now. Go on down. We'll, 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 get, we'll gather your stuff up. And uh, if, in case you want to ask a few more questions of uh, Richard and Dan out in the lobby there. Now, tomorrow morning, we start at 8.30 a.m. The doors open at 7.30. Is that right? Doors will open at 7.30. So you don't want to miss tomorrow. And uh, as Dan's gathering him stuff, just give him a minute. Uh, so he can get back there to the lobby with Richard. Oh, and yeah, and check out The God Who Speaks, the uh, documentary that was premiered today. I know, I know many of you saw it, some of you didn't, but I think they're already s almost sold out of DVDs, and they brought uh, almost 300 of them with them, so it was a very impactful uh, documentary. So if you didn't see it, you want to pick up a copy, and even if you did see it, you want to pick up a copy. It'll make for a, uh, a great Christmas gift, right? Give the gift of the Bible. All right. Well, Dan's going that way. Maybe he'll make his way out there. Let's close. Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing uh, two men together to discuss whether or not you do exist. We, of course, believe you do and that you created and sustain all things. We pray that you'd sustain us tonight and bring us back here safely tomorrow for more. In Christ's name, amen.